Um, welcome to be uh, one of the panels of the open source stream today. Uh, we are fee record an open source case study. Stay in this room throughout the day if you want some sweet open source presentation. Um, uh, I'm Amy Schweikert. I'm a student at MIU Twinning Image Archiving and Preservation Program. Um, I worked with V-Record, which you'll hear more about, um, in my internship at CUNY Television last year. I'm Savannah Campbell, and my first experience uh, with V-Record was also as an intern at CUNY TV. Uh, this was in the fall of 2016, and it was the first coding or open source project I ever worked on. And later on, uh, I worked for the Dance Heritage Coalition at their video digitization hub, where I became a daily user of the record software. I'm Libby Hopoff. I'm the program manager and audiovisual archivist for Moving Image Preservation of Puget Sound, or MEPOPS. And I'm also the project audiovisual archivist for Seattle Municipal Archives. And I use record on a daily basis at both institutions to capture video. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Weaver. I'm the Digital Infrastructure and Preservation Librarian at Washington State University. Um, I started working with V-Record uh, when I was at University of Washington at the Media Center there. Uh, we used it on a pretty regular basis for digitization. And then I uh, became even more familiar with it when I was uh, doing the NDSR stewardship at uh, CUNY. So. All right, so let's get going. Uh, oh, we said who we are. Um, <laughs> What is V-Record though? Um, V-Record is a piece of open source software to digitize or transfer your videotapes. Um, it takes composite component S-Video and SDI connections. It's free to download and use, but it requires Mac OS and a Blackmagic capture card. Um, it was designed with AV Archivist in mind. It was originally a, a Nomia Hack Day project that ended up sort of shepherded by Dave Bryce, who contributed a lot of the code. Um, but as open source software, it's available on the EMEA open source GitHub. Um, anyone can contribute to it, which makes it really flexible and customizable. This is what the VRecord capture screen looks like. Um, uh, in the upper left, you see the video signal. Um, next to it, you see the video signal compressed with all of the pixels out of broadcast range highlighted in yellow, which helps you monitor whether your levels are too hot. Um, in the bottom left, you have a waveform and then a vector scope, so you're able to monitor the digital signal as it uh, is being captured. V-Record was designed with AV archivists in mind, so there are a lot of sort of uh, archi archival standard or um, com commonly used uh, options available. You have a lot of control over what sort of file you make. The, um, you have a couple different options for your file format and codec. They create uh, preservation level files, so you can do QuickTime Uncompressed, Matroska FFV1, MXF JPEG 2000. You can choose 8-bit uh, or 10-bit, your television standard, and um, you have a couple different audio options, and you also have uh, a number of options for logging and uh, reporting. Some of those logs uh, are here, I mean, they're up on the screen, so they don't, you can't really read any of it, but um, on the left you have uh, a log that captures all of your hardware while you're recording, so in the future, when you're going back and wondering um, and trying to pinpoint maybe if something went wrong or if you're just curious at what point this was, Captured, you can see your your OS and also your capture card information. It's also got the ffmpeg command at the bottom. Um, the the ffmpeg command that captures the video file. The tool is built on um, ffmpeg and the Blackmagic developers kit. And on the right, there are video and audio quality control graphs that are created as part of the record. So you have an ability to sort of go in the file after the fact and do quality control once you've been captured. Um, so open source software, if you're unfamiliar, maybe there's some newbies in the room. Um, it's a couple of um, <coughs> sorry, a couple of basic features of open source software is that the code is open to everyone to view, to edit, to use. Um, you're you're able to sort of inspect what's actually going on with the tool you're using, and you're actually also able to make changes. In this case, we're hosting the code on GitHub. Um, anyone can contribute to the GitHub repository with an account. 
Um, and it's, that makes it also really collaborative. So when people are having trouble or maybe want to make the tool better, you get this built-in community to talk about be reported. Um, open source does rely on volunteer work. Um, so <coughs> it's no one's full-time job to maintain B record, which is nice, but sometimes but sometimes also, you know, it requires extra effort from everyone who's involved. Um, and if the tools it depends on upgrade, it can sometimes break. We usually do a pretty good job of trying to pinpoint the issue and fixing it, but it definitely relies on a couple of dependencies. Okay. Um, you can contribute to VRecord in a number of ways, and this is true of many open source projects. Um, you can write code, is what people usually think of when they're thinking about contributing. But you don't have to write code. You, it, it's really actually very helpful to use VRecord, test, and give feedback, and let us know what's up. Um, you can also use it and train others and spread the good news of VRecord. Um, and also, there's there's a lot of documentation that goes with a lot of it, since it's aimed at uh, audiovisual archivists and not necessarily programmers. Um, we were really trying to start at sort of like the most basic level of instruction, and so that everyone who wants to use it and who may not be familiar with the command line or coding at all um, can start up and sort of have a step by step guide of how to use VRecord. Okay, um, so I had never written a line of code in my life before I started working on Beardboard, and since that was a very uh, intimidating experience, I thought I'd share uh, a little bit about it, and if I can do it, anyone can, really. Um, so Beardboard is written in Bash, which is the same language of the Mac and other Unix-based command lines, so if you've ever uh, opened up the terminal on your Mac and run a, a command there, uh, you know Bash, or at least some of it. And uh, if you're just starting out, there's lots of free tutorials online. Um, if you Google it, there's many, many out there, and you can find one that's helpful for you. Um, and it's also OK to borrow from existing code that is out there and maybe mimic the structure of it and change it to do something that you want to do with it. Uh, so for me, something with record that was really helpful was actually going in and trying to read the code that was already there and try to understand piece by piece what each of it was doing. I know saying like I read, I read code to learn how to write it sounds both kind of obvious but also weird at the same time. It was something that truly helped me as I was first starting out and you know like if you're learning a spoken language you know what helps us truly really immerse yourself in it and to me I found that that was the best way for me to immerse myself in coding language. Um, and this is an open, as this is an open source project that's on GitHub, uh, it's a very welcoming environment to ask others to review and test your code for you. And you can do that on GitHub by submitting a pull request, which we will um, talk more about soon. And remember that it's okay to make mistakes when you're starting out. That's how you can learn and improve and the community is there to help you when you run into the, those mistakes. But you don't have to write code in order to contribute to your board or any other open source project. There's lots of other ways you can get involved uh, with the user community. And one of those ways uh, that Andy mentioned briefly earlier was updating the documentation. When someone uh, adds a new feature to the record, uh, the documentation of it will need to be updated too. And that's just, you know, plain English. Uh, and you're welcome to either add really robust documentation or even do something simple as correct our typos. That's also very helpful. And also just submitting user feedback uh, about what is and what isn't working for you with GitHub. And if you run into an error, uh, taking a screenshot of the error message you receive and sharing with the community is very helpful. And uh, on that, in that regard, GitHub is also a place for commiserating um, about these errors because if you're experiencing it, odds are that someone else is too. And we'll chime in, oh, I'm also having this problem. It's not just you. And uh, if all else fails, 
just being supportive of the project and stating that on GitHub, like with a good job guys, or even just an emoji, like seeing a thumbs up or a smiley face emoji on a comment or a piece of code that someone's contributing is actually really helpful and supportive and feels like you're doing something good. So this is what the GitHub page for record looks like. Um, I just wanted to go through it really quick so that if you're approaching it, you know sort of what you're dealing with. Um, in blue, in the upper left-hand corner, um, I've highlighted the issues tab, which is where you go to submit feedback or questions. Um, it works sort of like a forum in that you can just post your, your feedback or question and people can respond in a thread. Um, in red, right below that is the history of the code, if you're curious how it's changed. Um, in yellow, I've, uh, I've put in a box all of the different scripts and documents that make up the code. Um, the vRecord link, sort of in the middle alphabetically, is where the majority of vRecord's code lives, but there's also documentation and a few other scripts that it works with. Um, in sort of magenta, um, I've, on the top, I've highlighted the pull request tab, which is where you'd go to make any changes um, to the code or to the documentation that you'd like to make. Um, below it, I've also highlighted branches uh, in order to contribute a change and you need to create your own branch that you propose. And your branch is sort of like your personal change to the code that hasn't officially been accepted for the main sort of tree trunk of the code. Um, it's like a, it's a proposed change, not an official one yet. And um, in purple on the right, that green button is where you download the code so that you can run beer for yourself. Um, here are a couple of examples of issues, um, both submitted by Libby, thanks Libby, um, <laughs> with two, two really common types of issues. The first is tag wish, it's sort of a feature request, sometimes they're really simple, sometimes people suggest larger changes that could be a really cool project and really make the record more robust and helpful. And then below is a bug where something went wrong and so you're just reporting, letting people know. Okay, so I'm gonna, I think we're all gonna take care to talk about kind of our more individual experiences working on this project. Um, so I already touched on how I was totally new to writing code and working with Bash. Um, but I also wanted to highlight how um, writing code and using GitHub are kind of two different things. And GitHub also has a learning curve as well. Um, as you can see here, my first pull request did not go so well. <laughs> um, uh, and in this case, there actually wasn't anything wrong with the code itself. I just uh, was working on an out-of-date version of it and accidentally removed a newer edition that Andrew had made. <laughs> um, so pro tip, always use the most up-to-date version of the code that you're working with. Um, and one of the things about working on an open source project is that a lot of other people could be working on it simultaneously, and if you're working on different things, and maybe you left yours alone for a little while, check to make sure that when you come back to it, you're not accidentally removing someone else's work. Um, and while this was very embarrassing as my first like public <laughs> GitHub experience, um, it was a very valuable lesson learned, and um, it gets better, don't worry. Um, and part of like, other than kind of maneuvering the different app features of GitHub, uh, the other part of it is you are entering a community that does have a certain etiquette to it. Like there's ways to be polite uh, when you're posting and like learning good habits. Um, if you look back to my first pull request, you'll see that I didn't provide a description of what my code actually does. And that's not very helpful. Um, but if you look at a later example, I had a sentence just briefly describing what it does, so that's like already uh, more helpful to the people that are reviewing it for you, and this is something you just gets easier with time. Um, and you can also do things like tag and reference issues that other people have submitted, um, which again creates this kind of feedback loop where your code is responding, but an issue that someone else uh, had submitted earlier. And if someone 
replies, LGTM, or it looks good to me on your phone, that's something that you're doing something right. <laughs> um, and then it got merged. Uh, so one of the things that uh, I worked on during my internship was adding more built-in quality control features uh, to e-report. Um, so it, at, this happens after the capture is complete. If something has gone awry with it, uh, there's this built-in reporting mechanism to flag certain issues and let you know that you need to look at your uh, video file because there might be something wrong with it that requires further investigation. Um, so, so it's always a helpful tool to um, identify issues uh, with your capture. And this was an example where features like this had already existed in the report. So um, I had kind of mimicked the structure of that part of the code and changed the values so it would test for what I uh, wanted it to. And um, as you can see within the report, these warnings use a very helpful cow message um, to let you know what's going wrong. And I wanted to kind of highlight this because an example that code doesn't need to be practical, it also can be fun and you can have fun with it. Um, like just having this come up in red and all caps would get the same message across, but if it's a cow telling you, it's like, okay, I'll listen to the cow. <laughs> Um, and this is an example from later on. Um, after I had left uni, I was looking at the Dance Heritage Coalition, uh, where I was, in, I was in less of a direct programming role, but also a user feedback and testing role. Uh, so I had um, an issue with uh, the captures um, the, that I was making uh, pretty consistently. So what I did was took a screenshot of the error messages I was getting. Um, if you can see, uh, it might be kind of hard to read in that example, this uh, kind of buffer overrun message. So I submitted it as an issue on GitHub, and then this was a case where Annie was actively, act actively working at CUNY, and she was like, try this, a new addition that I made to test it out. I was able to test it out, and uh, we were eventually able to get it uh, working a little bit better. Um, and kind of a final point I wanted to highlight, um, since I've talked so much about how I was new and terrified of Bash and GitHub at first, um, I wanted to say that actually learning how to code and contributing to an open source project in, in, on either end of it is also very empowering. And being part of this user community and contributing to it and seeing the changes you make out there that people are using in the real world is very gratifying. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Um, I would also agree with Savannah uh, and should also say that I had not coded before um, interning at CUNY. My, the most experience I had with coding was um, I made music autoplay on my MySpace page, copying <laughs> someone else's HTML. So uh, if you've done that too, Join me. Um, so at CUNY during my internship, I actually spent a lot of time looking through the issues tab and looking for people's problems or feature requests and uh, taking them on as sort of projects to to do some work on. Um, because we oh, sorry, because we record is so verbose about um, errors and warnings and logs, it's actually really consistent in terms of the feedback that you're getting and it's really useful information for people who are looking through what the issues have, such as me, um, and trying to pinpoint where exactly the problems are happening. So um, just wanted to put in a plug for posting your error logs when you're reporting any issues. Um, there are sort of three categories of feedback that um, this project gets, and I think it's probably true of many open source projects. Uh, V-Record is broken, a classic. Um, <laughs> is V-Record supposed to work like this, which is sort of a subcategory of is V-Record broken, but sometimes the answer is yes, and it's just kind of, it just kind of works like that. Like maybe in the future we'll do something about it, but it's going okay. Um, and then there are a number of like V-Record could be better suggestions, some of which are small, some of which are large, some of which we're able to devote resources to, some of which um, our bigger projects that maybe we can't take on right now, but um, please submit your ideas, work on your ideas, patches are always welcome. Um, 
view records feedback, which by the way is all generated by the record itself. It's not sort of a built-in feature of um, this program. It's it, it comes out of the code that people have written. Um, but the fact that it gives so much feedback kind of creates this positive feedback loop where you, even if you're not familiar sort of with the command line or open source software, you get a pretty clear warning that something might be wrong. And so you're more you're more able, I think, to tell when something could be wrong, report it back to the GitHub, um, and then we can work on it. Whereas if it weren't quite so verbose, maybe you wouldn't notice that something hadn't quite worked out. You wouldn't know whether you should report it back or not. And so that, that creates a really nice um, channel of communication. Um, I just wanted to go to a couple of examples of automated quality control that I worked on during my internship. Um, there's, um, Oh, I'm so sorry. So, um, there we go. I automated a couple of checks for whether your um, values for sort of Luma and Chroma are exceeding locally set, uh, or say broadcast range values that are typically accepted as, as good limits on the, the brightness, the darkness, the saturation. Um, and view record once it is done writing your file will go through and sort of um, pick out those values and give you a warning if your file has too many, say, super bright frames. And that gives you a little hint that you should maybe check out what was happening. Maybe you can fix your analog setup. Maybe it's a view record problem. Um, another example uh, are file format policies. Depending on which file format uh, you want to create with view record. The record can, in some cases, check whether the file that was created actually adheres to the standards of that format. Um, so there are sort of open standards for some file formats, and the record can check whether it's creating files that are correct according to that. So in the first case, when you maybe have a file that ends up being too bright, that's probably, it could be a problem with your own setup, and so you would maybe fix it there. But in the second case, if the record creates a file that doesn't conform to file format standards, you aren't really controlling any part of the file format of the file creation, so that would probably be a problem with view record that you could go report to the GitHub with confidence that it's not your fault. Hello, uh, again. Um, uh, like I said before, um, I'm Libby Hotbach, and um, I work as an AV archivist for both MePops and the Seattle Municipal Archives. And just for context, MePOP supports videotape digitization and preservation by archivists, museums, libraries, historical societies, science and arts organizations, and related institutions that uh, have analog video in their collections but don't have the expertise or the equipment to digitize it or deal with it. Um, so in that sense, uh, uh, Beer Court has been a really valuable asset to MePOP's digitizing workflow. Education is a huge component of our model to ensure st uh, sustainability for videotape preservation locally in Seattle and hopefully in a larger context. Um, this means that uh, as part of my work at MePOPS, I train our participating institutions <laughs> to digitize their videotape. We don't just do it for them. We actually like walk them through the whole process and teach them how to care for their files. And, yeah. um, so most of these archivists do not have previous experience um, working with moving images and definitely not with coding. And the look of sheer terror that will appear on their faces when I say, okay, open the terminal, and they're like, I don't even know what that is, um, was sort of, it was disconcerting to me as a trainer, and it felt like a big roadblock in getting other people to use this really great free tool. And so, uh, in, like, also, for context, we have a manual that we put together to like try to address different learning sources, and we try to adjust our workflow um, to best uh, teach people in the way that they learn the best. Some people are very visual, some people want to really read through a bunch of stuff, and for people who are really visual, uh, just typing in a command line in the terminal was really odd and like too abstract for them to really comprehend how the whole thing was working. And so I collaborated with uh, Andrew to make um, the GUI mode. Uh, and on Mepox's setups, we have just like a little shell script uh, icon sitting on the desktops. 
And if you double click it, this will pop up. And um, it just makes it a lot more user friendly and that makes the whole process more intuitive and accessible to people who aren't necessarily familiar with any of these parts for a dig uh, digitizing workflow. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so the, um, another tool in your report that's really helpful is the pass-through mode. And uh, this is the visual numerical uh, view that's up there right now. And it provides information about the image while it's capturing, which allows the user to make adjustments and immediately observe the results. And uh, the processing time is uh, dramatically decreased since ViewReport allows you to identify visual problems with the highlighting and other visual cues uh, to correct artifacts and adjust the levels to their proper place. And this helps a lot because um, I don't just uh, sort of have the people like, jump around, like look over here at this waveform, then over here at like what's coming out of the players, but it's all sort of in one central place and it allows them not only to do it themselves after a while, but also to really think more deeply about like what's causing that or like what's off. And sometimes they're able to just like go really quickly. And usually by the end, they feel really comfortable making these adjustments and they understand what they're seeing because there's so many great visual cues. And uh, combined with QC tools, it's been a really valuable uh, teaching and learning uh, method for me. Um, just because, like I said, it helps address a bunch of the different learning styles and just makes the whole process uh, more accessible. Um, so when I was first using ViewReport, I told everyone we were working with and myself to delete the blocks. Don't delete the blocks. Okay? <laughs> so I honestly just really didn't know, unless there was an issue that occurred, I didn't really think that they were necessary and it seemed like a lot of extra information for the people and I now learned that's very wrong and they're very helpful. Um, so the information in there doesn't, not only like gives you a lot of great uh, feedback about what happened with your file, but it can sometimes later help you figure out um, something that went wrong with a recording that maybe you weren't even a part of uh, for whatever reason. And then it can allow you to go back and like make those adjustments and fix things later. So for example, we've been recently encountering some issues following updates to some of the coding components that um, were that are part of the report. And we started, oh no, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, so this video basically just has question marks going like this really fast in the, um, in the terminal. And it was one of the versions that Dave had sent me to test out on our um, Set up because we were trying to figure out was it your report, was it our setup, like what was going wrong, and how could we fix it and make it um, work for us again. And having those question marks go like crazy uh, was definitely like hilarious, but also just immediately I knew something was wrong. Uh -huh. But uh, it's really great, like how Savannah was describing, having that different feedback built in where it immediately will even tell you as you're recording, like buffer overrun, and you can stop your recording, you don't have to like wait all the way to the end to get it from the cow, and um, <laughs> which can be really frustrating because for a while we had all these recordings that after 45 minutes, buffer overrun, it was done, which was frustrating because every time we tested a different thing or changed one variable of the whole step, uh, we had to wait 45 minutes to see whether or not it worked. And while it's time consuming and really, really frustrating, like uh, my novel length posts that I made to uh, GitHub during that time, detailing every single thing I'd done, were validated by people saying, I'm having the same issue, and uh, making suggestions and trying different things. And we now can successfully capture uh, using an unfiltered method that uh, was, um, that Dave built in so that there's no information going um, with the visual and numerical display when we're recording. We switch to just a basic window and that allows our computers to not freak out and get over, get a buffer overrun. So then we're able to successfully capture it and that's been great and really valuable, just the customized, customizability of the program um, for us and for others. Cool. Uh, hey, I'm Andrew again. Um, 
I kind of want to take a similar approach uh, to what everyone's been doing uh, and just kind of contextualize uh, my experiences uh, with V-Record. And it, there's a, quite a bit of overlap, I think, because a lot of people have kind of gone through the same experiences. So I think that if there's one takeaway that anyone might get out of this is that if you are interested in participating in uh, one of these open source projects, be it V-Record or something else, and you are feeling confused or a little bit shy, that's how everyone feels, and so that's totally okay, and you should not feel bad about that. Um, this, I, I wanted to put a picture of my first pull request um, to be recorded, which was also my first pull request to an open source project ever. Uh, what was going on was basically um, we had had Dave Rice come out to the University of Washington, um, and while he was there, he kind of made an offhanded comment when somebody was like, oh, can this capture PAL? And he just kind of made an offhanded comment like, oh, it could, you know, you just have to change this one variable, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, and we actually had a pretty decent um, Slavic Studies film collection that was all PAL, so I was like, well, I guess that guy Dave said that it was just one variable, so <laughs> maybe, maybe I can hunt down what that variable is and take a stab at it. And I had never worked with Bash before. I did not know what I was looking at. I was, but uh, kind of as Savannah said, like reading the code to learn the code. I, I opened it up and I looked for patterns, and even if I didn't know what those patterns were doing, I was like, that's probably it, and then that, maybe if I tweak this variable, and so I found it, and I was able to do it. And I was feeling pretty smug, I was feeling pretty good about myself, and I was like, oh, now I have to figure out this GitHub thing. Um, and I tried to make a pull request after, just from the way I phrased that, I probably sat there and looked at it about half an hour, being like, what should I say, you know? Um, so I was apologetic and confused, and uh, you know, what's the etiquette about all this? Um, and then I did it, and then Dave was just like, oh, this is great, and he didn't jump all over me, like, you phrased that wrong, and he merged it. Um, and I was like, cool, that really worked. And then about a day later, uh, the people at CUNY were like, uh, did you test this, by the way? And I was like, apparently not enough. And so then my second pull request is me fixing uh, the pass-through mode that I had broken by um, failing to copy over some of the patterns that I isolated. I, I found them in one part of your record and didn't realize that they were also in another part of your record. Um, so that was my first experience, and it was not actually scary, and nobody was mean, and nobody jumped all over me. Um, and especially with the uh, the EMEA open source uh, group, I think that that is a very kind of safe place to commit to. Um, if you want to try something, um, nobody will be nasty to you. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of um, a bit of my involvement and kind of contextualize that again with how it works with the kind of community around these open source projects. Uh, one area that I focused on, um, just because I kind of like it, uh, is addressing some of the audio issues uh, in the record. I've always found that kind of fun. And uh, this is just kind of pictures. I know it's probably hard to read. I was trying to how, how do you visualize people you know, asking questions on GitHub? It's, it's not very pretty to look at. But these are all things that uh, various people, including Hannah over there, have uh, just opened issues uh, like people have been talking about, um, be it either, oh, it'd be really cool if we had this feature, or oh, something broke, or, um, and this kind of runs the gamut of, um, oh, I'm trying to, I have a certain audio like this, can we uh, make it so that we can just map the audio in this way? Um, or, oh, I would like to have some kind of um, audio bars to make sure everything's plugged in right. And then uh, one of the big ones, I think I put it up there, um, that also kind of shows how this is kind of a give and take and a feedback loop with the community was um, there was an issue in uh, V-Record earlier on um, with audio levels where when I was um, digitizing things with it at the uh, Libraries Media Center, I was like, well, this is working really great, but the audio levels kind of sound low for my, my files I've made. Hey, Libby, do you have this problem? She's like, yeah, the audio levels sound kind of low. And then there were some other people um, from other institutions kind of posting on the GitHub, be like, uh, we've kind of compared the audio levels with other captures, and they're kind of low. Um, and at CUNY, they were like, well, we don't have that problem. We, we don't know what's going on. Um, and so, uh, but, Kind of fortunately, soon after that, I was uh, at CUNY for the NDSR residency, so I decided that I would kind of take a look at this and try to isolate what was going on. And we figured out that uh, due to the way that um, ViewRecord was using FFmpeg to map audio channels, for whatever reason, um, for audio that was being captured through an analog source, it was dropping the levels down. And CUNY um, wasn't capturing from audio, they're capturing from SDI. And so they weren't experiencing that. So of course, they wouldn't notice. You know, they say, well, everything works fine. And so this was really kind of an example of how uh, people in the community pointing out this thing were essential for uh, helping the project out and kind of making the tool a stronger tool because, um, well, that's just how it works. You can't do everything, and there's all these random variables, uh, and you might not notice them just depending on your setup and things like that. So it's really a give and take. So I think that some people might think that 
uh, especially when they're just first starting out. Oh, is it okay if, if I like open an issue on this project and ask for them to do this thing? Uh, you know, am I, am I being rude by asking for something? But it's really a give and take. You're actually helping the people who are creating the tools by doing that, and it's it's really a two way street. If I can unfreeze my computer screen here, I can't. But <laughs> um, that's okay. I don't that is. Um, so this is a couple other uh, examples of um, that's those audio bars that uh, were kind of a result of Hannah's request. Um, they're still very imperfect, just due to again, um, like Annie mentioned, uh, sometimes people like, is it supposed to be like this? And we're kind of yeah, you know, that's it's it's running off of one thing, and sometimes that's the best it can do. Um, but it was um, another thing that I had a lot of fun with um, responding to a request for help and trying to add some kind of um, audio mode where you can preview the audio levels. Uh, you can't still do that during uh, digitization because of like, some of the underlying issues, but it's there now. And then one other thing I wanted to point out was um, something that is uh, very dear to me. Uh, it is kind of a little project of mine that. I like to consider it a kind of sibling project to be recorded. Um, it's kind of a sibling project. But I, I was very much inspired by record um, and its video capabilities to try to do something like that for audio, um, especially um, since I was coming out of a um, library's media center environment where I had access to tons of pretty flashy audio digitization software. And then when I left that environment, um, all I had was Audacity and things like that because I didn't feel like spending a few hundred dollars on um, a digital audio workstation. And so I was like, well, you know, V-Record has all these amazing options for video capture. Maybe there could be something for audio. So I have a little project called Audio Recorder. Um, there's a screen of it there. I guess you can probably see the similarities to V-Record. Uh, it's up where it's all uh, built around audio and it's supposed to um, kind of take a similar approach and philosophy of being built by artists for artists. Um, to kind of address issues uh, that are more specific to our needs versus uh, to the digital audio production needs. Uh, here's uh, another picture from that project, just showing that it's, it's kind of evolving a little bit. Um, I've been working recently on trying to port it over um, into a full Ruby background versus its origins as a full Bash backend, which is uh, the same as uh, V-Record, because again, it was heavily uh, influenced by V-Record. And um, I wanted to give a little shout out, speaking of um, people, uh, how much people can contribute to projects. Uh, this project could use a lot of help, so uh, especially in the testing realm. Um, so if somebody is looking uh, for a way to um, get involved with any kind of project, be it testing or anything, um, you can always open issues on that, because I, I won't yell at you, I'll be overjoyed. <laughs> And I wanted to close it on the note uh, for my part that um, this is a recent pull request of mine to one of the other EMEA open source uh, projects, FF Improviser. Um, and so this is just from a month or so ago. Uh, and as you can see, I am still breaking things. Uh, and it's still OK. And nobody is angry. Um, and so even if you have a lot of experience and have um, made a lot of pull requests and worked this up a lot, uh, you'll still break stuff, and that's okay too. So don't be afraid to break things. If you break things, don't be afraid that people are going to be really nasty to you, especially again in this community, um, because it's just not like that. And it's it's okay to break things, and it's okay to kind of feel worried about breaking things, but but it's okay. Okay, we're gonna try and do a little something that depends a little bit on the Wi-Fi, so fingers crossed. But we wanted to demonstrate how to make a pull request because it really is. It's easy, you can totally do it. Um, yeah, so let's let's check it out. This is the GitHub site um, for V Recorded. It's hosted in the EMEA open source sort of group. Um, let's say that I wanted to change something in the documentation. Um, and the documentation source starts here. You can see a bunch of links to different, um, different parts. And 
Let's say I go to the contributing section and it says we want B-Record to be a helpful tool for audiovisual archivists and others and I want to add anyone can contribute to B-Record right after that. What I will want to do is, this is the readme.md, so I go into readme.md in that list of files. There's a little edit, edit this file button over here and it'll pop up. And, and this is the document where I can make changes. So let me just type this real quick. So um, after I make my changes, um, it's helpful to sort of give your change a title and like a little one-liner saying what I did. So I'll do that right here too. <laughs> Hashtags don't work the same way. Um, so in order to suggest this change, I, I can't just make the change and have it show up in all the record code because that's, that there's sort of, a, there's sort of a, an approval set in the middle to make sure that people aren't just making changes and we don't know what they mean or you know it's just sort of a, a security and discussion step. So I will create a new branch for this commit. It's very easy. All I have to do is say, um, just give it a name and it'll automatically create a branch and start a pull request. Now a pull request is what it's called when you propose a change, um, which I personally found incredibly confusing and I, I don't know. But so I will commit the change, open a pull request, create the pull request, um, and once I have created the pull request, someone is going to have to review it. So maybe one of you can review it. Okay, you can't see what I'm doing, but I popped into there, uh, and this all should, you'll be able to see that in the things in real time, hopefully. Um, so I uh, went and logged in and was looking at that, but had I not been, uh, it now sends out um, email alerts to people who have, um, are following this repository or who are working with this repository and have started to <laughs> <laughs> um, And so I would go in now and I'll take a look at it and I will judge it um, and see. <laughs> And then I'm going to merge it. Uh, okay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and so now that's part of your <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Anyway, so it really is easy. You can totally do it. We would love if you did. Um, I guess we'll open the floor for questions now. If anyone has any, um, just it's this um, this program is being live streamed, so. Uh, thank you. Um, are there any big uh, like documentation-based issues right now that would be good for people not sure if coding to like hop onto and uh, crack at it? That's a great question. Let's go check the issues to have. <laughs> Yeah, we were actually demonstrating view record yesterday at the um, at the pavilion, and we got um, a couple people who came and immediately asked some questions about.